So many churches today are filled with false teachers, heretics, and wolves in sheep's clothing. So today we'll be considering what it really means to be a false teacher and how to be a discerning Christian. And if you go to a church where the pastor is guilty of one of these bad qualities, it might be time to start looking for a new church. Hi, my name is David Cipriano. I'm a youth pastor, and here on this YouTube channel, we're all about learning the Bible and its principles. We cover topics like theology, apologetics, and Christian living. And in today's episode, I'm going to show you how to recognize false teachers and their false teachings, because for many of us, it might feel hard to tell if somebody is good or not. So we're going to talk about how to spot false teachers, and we're going to look at some common characteristics to look out for. Now, this is kind of a controversial topic because whenever you talk about calling out other people for their false doctrines, and when you label people as heretics, a lot of people will say something like, let's not judge or be calling each other out. And I think that it's true that we shouldn't be constantly pointing out every minor problem that we see in a person. But I think that we also have to realize that Jesus warned people about false teachers. He said in Matthew 7, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. He gives another warning in Matthew 24, 24, where he said, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And the sad reality is that not everybody is on the right side. Just because somebody is a preacher or a pastor or a supposed Bible teacher doesn't mean that they have the right doctrines or the best intentions. And so often people will abuse their spiritual authority and take advantage of and deceive other people. And I think that if we don't pay attention and if we're not careful and look out for the warning signs, we might be deceived by a wolf in sheep's clothing. And that's really why I'm making this episode. It's not just to start drama or to call people out. It's because the Bible warns us about false teachers. And if we're going to be on the lookout, we need to know how to recognize these people when they come. You see, 1 John 4, 1, we have this warning, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And I think that as a Christian, you should be discerning and you should not believe everything that you hear. Like, for example, if you watch the news or if you read the news, it would be very foolish to just blindly accept whatever you hear. Now, we should all have some level of skepticism, and we should all have some discernment. And this isn't just true about the news, it's also true about church. Because you shouldn't walk into a church service and then just blindly assume that everything that you hear will be right. Because the reality is that there's real false teachers out there, and we need to have a certain level of skepticism so that we don't get led astray. And I really think that false teachers are dangerous people. Sometimes these people will steal money, or they might deceive others into giving them their money. Sometimes these people will teach false doctrines that get in the way of understanding God's word. Sometimes these people will abuse their authority and wrongfully exercise control over people's lives. Sometimes false teachers say, God told me, but then they'll use others' gullibility and belief to do terrible things and to deceive people. And really, there are some heresies out there that are so dangerous that if they're believed, they could lead a person to hell. And before we get into how to recognize a false teacher, I just want to make this clarification that a false teacher is not just anybody who's wrong about something. 
I mean, if that were the case, then it would all be false teachers. We're all humans. We all make mistakes. None of us are omniscient. And so I think that any pastor or any Bible teacher is going to have some level of error. And so we can't just call anybody a false teacher just because they've been wrong about something because then everybody would be a false teacher and it would become a meaningless label. You see here, when I'm talking about a false teacher, what I mean is somebody who has a consistent habit of being false, and especially whenever it comes to the essentials of the Christian faith, and that's a person who refuses to be corrected. You see, a false teacher denies fundamental truths, and they contradict Jesus' teachings, and as a result, they're unqualified for teaching the Bible. And I just want to make it clear that there is a difference between having a false teaching and being a false teacher. You see, there are some essential, non-negotiable teachings of the Christian faith. For example, these essentials might be things like the Trinity, the inerrancy of the Bible, the deity of Jesus Christ. These fundamentals would include salvation by grace through faith, the resurrection of Jesus. You see, these are things that we have to know and to understand. And if a person denies and rejects these things, then they're a heretic. But I also think that there are some non-essentials, and not non-essential as in they're not important, but you could be wrong about these things, and we could have some disagreement without necessarily being a false teacher. I think that some of these non-essentials could be some details of the end times. A lot of those passages can feel pretty confusing, and we might misunderstand them without intentionally doing so, without intentionally twisting scripture. I think that Christians can disagree about some details of creation. I think that good Christians could have some different views of understanding the Mosaic law. Another common mistake or error could be just something as simple as you quote a Bible verse, but you get one word wrong. You see, there's a big difference between error and heresy. Because error is just simply the result of human mistakes. Error happens with everybody. But heresy is a deliberate twisting of scripture, and it's being wrong about major issues. And obviously, error isn't good. Whenever a person makes a mistake, we shouldn't just completely ignore it and just turn a blind eye to it. But I think that we should realize that error is not on the same level as heresy. And hopefully throughout this episode, it'll become really clear to you the difference between just simply being an imperfect person and being an actual false teacher. There's a difference between being a false teacher and having a false teaching. So with all that being said, I'm going to show you seven signs of a false teacher. And the first sign is that they misunderstand who Jesus is. You see, we have to realize that Jesus was not just a good man or a prophet or a religious teacher. No, Jesus was God in the flesh. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior of the world. And really, what a person believes about Jesus is the most important thing. This is more important than any other doctrine. And whenever we're trying to spot a false teacher, we have to consider what do they believe about Jesus? Because 2 John 9 says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. And so according to the Bible, if you are not living in the doctrine of Christ, then you don't have God. You cannot have the Father without the Son. No, we have to have some understanding of who Jesus is. We have to agree with the Bible and how God's Word portrays Him. Jesus made it clear how important His identity was to His disciples in Matthew chapter 16, where it says that He asked His disciples, saying, "'Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am?' 
And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So evidently, a lot of people had a lot of wrong ideas about who Jesus was. And here's Jesus' response to them. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bardona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we see that through reading this passage, the affirmation that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, was so important that it was the rock on which Jesus built his church. And while we're on the topic of this verse, I want to make it very clear to everybody listening that Peter was not the rock that the church was built on. The rock that the church was built on was his affirmation that Jesus was the Christ. And I'm saying this because many people, such as Catholics, would say that Peter was the rock that Jesus built his church on, that Peter had infallible authority, that Peter was the first pope. And a lot of people will take a lot of twisted interpretations out of this verse. So I just wanted to make it clear what this verse really means. Another Bible passage where we see how important it is to know who Jesus is comes in 1 John 2, where it says, Who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also." And so the Bible shows us that if you reject Jesus and deny essential teachings about him, then you're not saved. You are anti-Christ, not meaning that you are the anti-Christ, but that simply you are opposed to Christ. The Bible shows us that you can't have God the Father without having God the Son. And so it's so important that we recognize who Jesus is, and this is one of the biggest signs of a false teacher that they don't know who he is. And I think that often, whenever we try to identify cult groups, the first thing to point out is what they believe about Jesus. For example, one cult is Mormonism because they believe that Jesus is the spirit brother of Satan. They think that he wasn't always God. They teach that Jesus came to the Americas and ministered to the Native Americans after his resurrection. You see, these people say that they believe in Jesus, but their version of Jesus is not the biblical Jesus. These people have a fake version of Jesus who was made up by false prophets like Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. And as a result, Mormons don't really even know who Jesus actually is. You see, they talk about Jesus, they use his name, they say that they love him, but they're talking about a different person than who Christians are talking about. There's a huge difference between the Mormon Jesus and the biblical Jesus. Another group that claims to be Christian, but they're wrong about who Jesus is, is the Jehovah's Witnesses. You see, according to them, Jesus is a created being. They say that he is a God, but not God Almighty. They say that he's the Son of God, but not God himself. And they even believe that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. You see, these people are false teachers and heretics because they deny fundamental truths about Jesus. And similar to the Mormons, these people don't know who Jesus is. Sure, they can say that they love him, they can use his name, but they're obviously not talking about the same person. And if they can't even get Jesus right, I wouldn't be quick to believe them about anything. And so, whenever we try to point out false teachers, number one, we need to consider who they believe Jesus is. Number two, the second red flag of a false teacher is that they contradict the Bible. You see, as Christians, we recognize the Bible as the Word of God. 
Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3.16, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and in righteousness. And so as Christians, we affirm that the Bible is true and inerrant. It is the word of God. And as a result, anybody who contradicts with the Bible or disagrees with the Bible is wrong. And a false teacher may do something like deny the inerrancy of the Bible. They'll claim that the Bible has mistakes, that it has contradictions. A false teacher might deny the infallibility of the Bible. They might not see prophecy as being true. They might get the authority of the Bible wrong. Maybe they recognize the Bible as a good book, but a good book that we don't necessarily have to follow. They might claim to have authority that's equal to the Bible. So false teachers will get the Bible wrong. And one way that they might do this is by teaching another gospel. You see, if we look at what Paul wrote in Galatians 1, he said, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed." As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So in other words, if a person disagrees with the Bible about the gospel, they are a false teacher. They're a heretic and they're anathema. I think that another way that we can identify a false teacher is by them saying, God told me. Now, I want to clarify that I am not denying that God speaks. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in His ministry. And I'm not completely, totally opposed to saying, God told me, because I do believe that God can speak to us. But I also think that whenever somebody says, God told me, we should be skeptical about it. We shouldn't be quick to rush to believe them. Because often a person justifies whatever they say or do because supposedly God told them, and yet what God allegedly told them contradicts the Bible. You see, the Spirit of God never contradicts the Word of God. And so, if a person says, God told me, and it's something that goes against the scriptures, then God obviously didn't tell them that. I think that one example of a false teacher who did this was Joseph Smith. For example, he claimed that God told him to marry many wives. According to him, God told him that there were no good churches, so he should go and start his own. And there's a lot of ways that Joseph Smith deceived people by saying, God told me, and sadly, his followers were gullible enough to believe it. Another example, an even more extreme example of this, is Jim Jones. He was the leader of the People's Temple, that group who infamously drank the Kool-Aid committing mass suicide. You see, he often claimed to have divine revelation, but he obviously didn't. He would claim God told me, but then he would lead his people to do something that God definitely did not tell him. You see, these are only a couple of examples, but I could give you so many more. And whenever people justify their lies by saying, God told me, they are using God's name in vain. You see, using God's name in vain is not just about saying OMG, but it's really also about hijacking God's name for your own personal agenda. It's just slapping God's name on something that he has nothing to do with. Another way that false teachers contradict the Bible is that they reinterpret the Bible to make it fit their ideology. In other words, they commit eisegesis instead of exegesis. With eisegesis, you're just reading into the text where you have your already held beliefs and then you interpret the Bible in light of them. But then with exegesis, you just simply read the Bible and then draw your beliefs from there. 
You see, sometimes a false teacher will come across a Bible passage that they don't like or they don't agree with, and they'll read a verse that's very plain and very clear and simple, but then they'll say, oh, it can't mean this. For example, people do this about homosexuality. They'll do this whenever it comes to gender roles. A person might see a verse like John 3.16 that very clearly talks about eternal security, but then because they already think think that it's not possible or true, they'll say, oh, it can't mean that. I think that Calvinists will sometimes do this. They'll see verses like 2 Peter 3, 9, but then they'll say, oh, it can't mean this because of some already held belief. You see, false teachers reinterpret the Bible to fit their beliefs instead of just simply reading the Bible and then drawing their beliefs from there. And this practice is just not being honest with the text. Now, the next mark of a false teacher is that they don't teach the Bible. And maybe at first this sounds exactly like the last point, but I think that there's really a distinction here. You see, on one hand, you might contradict the Bible by twisting it or perverting it or trying to change the clear meaning of it, but there's also another level where you just simply don't teach the Bible, where you avoid it. And I think that false teachers will often avoid uncomfortable topics. They'll sometimes preach what people want to hear instead of what they need to hear. You see, there's a lot of sins that people don't like being confronted about. And what a false teacher will do is they'll excuse them and ignore them. These sins would include things like drunkenness, homosexuality, transgenderism, abortion, pornography. You see, these are sins that people get very uncomfortable listening to. And as a result, many people, whenever they pretend to teach the Bible, they'll just ignore these topics because it's uncomfortable. People don't like it. They don't want to lose their popularity. And I think that it also can go the other way because some pastors will emphasize these sins, but then they'll fail to talk about pride or loving your neighbor. They might avoid sins such as laziness or anger. And I think that there really needs to be a balance here. There needs to be a completeness where you're talking about the whole Bible, where there's nothing that you will not talk about. And as a youth pastor myself, we cannot be making the mistake of ignoring and dismissing what we don't like what we don't want to talk about. You see, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You see, whenever false teachers fail to teach the Bible, they are disagreeing with the truth that's being taught here because we should believe that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The whole entire Bible is profitable for us. But whenever people avoid certain sections and they try to skip over certain verses, they are denying this truth. I like what Paul says in Acts chapter 20, whenever he says, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. And just like Paul, I think that it should be the goal of every Bible teacher to declare all the counsel of God meaning that there's nothing that we refuse to preach on. You see, multiple times throughout the scriptures, we see that we shouldn't be adding to or removing from God's word. And I think that a false teacher might not necessarily try to remove books or remove verses, but they're essentially doing the same thing whenever they refuse to talk about these things. You see, as a pastor, there should be nothing that you refuse to cover that's in the Bible. And sure, some topics are more relevant than others. There's some Bible books that we should probably spend more time in than others. 
But if it's in the Bible, then we should be willing to teach it. For example, whenever Joel Osteen was once asked in an interview about whether or not a homosexuality is a sin, whether or not it breaks the rules of Christianity, here's what he said. Um, you know, it, it, it would be, but Mark, I, I don't, you know, I don't really focus on a lot of those things. I try to stay in my lane of what I feel called to do. Mm. Now, that, that does come up in, in interviews and things, but just don't feel like that. That's not my core message. My core message is how do you, how do you have a healthy self-image? How do you let go of the past? How do you raise good children? How do you reach your dreams? You see, Joel Osteen is one of many pastors who fails and refuses to teach the whole counsel of God. People like Joel Osteen don't see all of Scripture as being profitable. And again, obviously an issue like homosexuality is not the only thing that you focus on. I think that it would be an overemphasis to talk about this thing every Sunday, but whenever you purposefully avoid it and ignore it like he tries to do, then you are dropping the ball. You are failing and refusing to do your job as a Bible teacher. I think that another red flag here, one that often goes unnoticed, is whenever we don't emphasize the Bible. You see, it's a really bad sign if a pastor preaches a whole sermon and they never read the Bible. I remember sitting in a church service once where that happened, where the preacher, he was a guest speaker, he gave a whole message, and not one single time did he read a Bible verse. And I tell you what, it feels like that day I didn't hear an actual sermon. It feels like I wasted my time by being there. Because as a pastor, you're a Bible teacher. That's your job to teach the scriptures. Not just to come up with some speech and then find some Bible verses that match up with it. No, the Bible is what you emphasize. And I think that that's one of the biggest problems with preaching in so many churches today because the sermon is not much more than a TED talk or a motivational speech. Many pastors are not really giving messages from the Bible. They're not really breaking down the passage. They're just simply using the Bible rather than teaching it. They have their speech, they have their motivational talk that they've written, and then they find Bible verses that align with it rather than finding a text and then drawing the truth from there. You see, I think that it's a major problem whenever people contradict the Bible, but it's also a problem when we don't really emphasize it and we fail to consistently and completely teach it. Now, this fourth sign that somebody is a false teacher is that they have ungodly character. And one of the ways that this happens is whenever a person doesn't meet the pastoral qualifications. Now, I realize here that there's leaders and teachers who may not be pastors or bishops like 1 Timothy 3 describes, but these things should definitely be true about pastors. And I think that it's a good idea if we apply these truths and hold ourselves accountable to them if we're any kind of spiritual leader. You see, here's that list of requirements that the Bible gives. It says, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, a filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. And I think that it's really important for us to realize here that whenever we look at these pastoral qualifications, it's about much more than just talent or speaking ability or storytelling or having a good personality. No, if you don't meet the requirements of 1 Timothy 3, you should not be a pastor, no matter how good people think that you are. In other words, you could have all of the talent, all of the skill, all of the personality, and yet still be unqualified because you don't meet the biblical requirements. 
And I think that one example that we recently learned about here was Stephen Lawson. Stephen Lawson was recently exposed for having a five-year affair with a woman in her 20s, even though he's in his 70s. And what makes this whole situation even more strange is that he wasn't even a member of the church that he was at. You see, people thought that he was pastoring and that he was actually a part of this church, but apparently he was just being paid to be there even though he wasn't a true member. Apparently, this man had been refusing authority from the start. This was a guy who had a lot of teachings that were good, and maybe his ministry still had some effect, but he had such terrible character, and it was sadly revealed that he was a wolf in sheep's clothing. Now, outside of his bad character, I would have some disagreements, but I would largely agree with many of his past teachings, and I would recognize that Stephen Lawson had talent, he had knowledge, But unfortunately, he had no good character, he was not a godly man, and even if he repents, which to my knowledge he hasn't repented, I still don't think that he would ever meet these biblical requirements to be a pastor again, because I don't think it would be possible for him to regain this good reputation. I mean, at this point in his life, he has soured his character so badly that he would never be able to have a good report of them which are without. His reputation is permanently damaged. You see, even if he publicly repents and he starts saying some good things again, his character still doesn't line up, and it didn't for so long. And I think that being a hypocrite and having a bad personal lifestyle is one of the biggest problems with the Pharisees of the Bible. You see, Matthew 23, it says, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. You see, this was a group of people who was rebuked and condemned, not just because of their teachings, but because of their actions. That's why it's so important, not just for pastors or for Bible teachers, but really all Christians, it's important for us that our character lines up with our message. We shouldn't be saying one thing, but then doing another. You see, this disqualifies us from ministry. It does more harm than good. In the book of Jude, whenever false teachers were being rebuked, the Bible says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. You see, these false teachers were rejecting God's plan and doing things their own way, like Cain did. These people were greedy, and they were prophesying falsely for money, like the prophet Balaam had done. These people are full of pride, and they refuse to submit to authority, like Korah in the Old Testament. And these criticisms aren't strictly about doctrine or teachings, they're about character. They're about motivations. And so, it's a major red flag whenever a pastor or some other spiritual leader has an ungodly lifestyle and bad character. This disqualifies you from ministry. Now, number five, this next way to identify a false teacher is that they are uncorrectable. In other words, they can't be told that they're wrong. They refuse to repent and they won't submit to authority. You see, earlier I talked about how a false teacher is not just anybody who has ever taught a false teaching. Now, there's a difference between having a false teaching and being a false teacher. And I think that one example from the Bible of this being true is the story of Apollos. You see, in Acts chapter 18, it says that a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And whenever it says here that he only knew the baptism of John, this was an evidence that his knowledge was incomplete. 
And in verse 26, it says, And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. So apparently, as Apollos was preaching the word, he had taught something that was wrong or incomplete. And Aquila and Priscilla, whenever they had heard this, they were discerning Christians and they pulled him aside and they taught him his wrongdoings. They had corrected his doctrine. And today we don't know exactly what this error was, but apparently he had had some limited, incomplete knowledge. It was some form of error. Now a person might have rushed to call him a false teacher, but Apollos was corrected and he had the humility to change his mind and his teachings. And the story continues in verses 27 and 28, where it says, And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. You see, as I said before, a false teacher is uncorrectable. They can't be told that they're wrong and they're too stubborn to change. But Apollos wasn't a false teacher. And yes, at one point he had had some error in some incomplete doctrine, but he was corrected. And when he was corrected, he changed. And that's one of the biggest signs that you're not a false teacher. I think about the televangelist Benny Hinn, who will often go through this cycle of him doing some terrible things, him deceiving people and scamming them out of their money, and then eventually he'll apologize, but then very quickly do all of the same sins again. And he'll do these fake repentances where he doesn't even address all of the sins that have been pointed out. And I find it very telling that Benny Hinn will only repent or pretend to repent whenever his PR gets so bad. And if you notice, his repentances are linked to major callouts, whether it's his nephew, Costi Hinn, calling him out, whether it's Mike Winger calling him out. I mean, he only repents whenever he feels like he has to, not because he's actually sorry, not because he's actually changing, but because people pressured him into doing it. And it's very telling that he'll go and commit the same sins again, as if he hadn't repented. And this is one of the reasons why it's evident he's a heretic. He is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Now, sign number six that somebody is a false teacher is that they will use results to justify their actions. You see, often whenever a discerning Christian criticizes a popular pastor or a large ministry, people will respond back to them by saying, oh, look, hundreds of people are being reached, or look at how many people just got saved. Stop being a Pharisee. Stop being so critical. And I think that on one hand, yeah, we're always happy whenever a person gets saved. If a person places their faith in Christ, that's great. That's not the problem here. But we can't just turn a blind eye to problems just because somebody ended up with some good results. And this is the error of pragmatism. It is using the ends to justify the means. You see, the Bible is so clear about being on guard against false teachers and against false doctrine. And I have never seen an exception in the Bible that says, but if people get saved, then let's just forget it. The Bible never says, do whatever you want if people get saved. The Bible never says that if a lot of people show up, then that means that you can just do anything and you can just ignore the other parts of the Bible. No, the Bible never says that, and neither should we. You see, just because something good happened and something profitable came out of it doesn't mean that you got there the right way. I mean, just because people attended and just because people got saved or made some decision doesn't mean that the event was good. For example, whenever Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, Joseph was able to eventually save many people. 
And Joseph says in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. You see, in this story, many people were saved because Joseph was placed there. Whenever Joseph got sold into slavery in Egypt, something good was able to come out of it. But that doesn't mean that his brothers did the right thing. That doesn't excuse them from their wrongdoings. No, just because God worked doesn't mean that every action leading up to it was right. And so, really, we shouldn't be falling for it whenever people say, oh, people got saved, that must mean that it's okay. Hey, another one of these results that people will try to use to justify their actions can be miracles. I mean, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 24, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So, Jesus says here that false Christians and false prophets would show great signs and wonders. And it kind of reminds me of how in the Old Testament, Pharaoh's magicians were able to do miracles like Moses did, but the fact that they were able to pull off these miracles didn't validate them. The fact that they had some miraculous result doesn't mean that they were right. Going back to the example of Benny Hinn again, often his supporters will use the fact that there's miracles that are done at his events to justify him. Like you can point out all of the false teachings that Benny Hinn has taught, and yet they'll just dismiss it by saying, look at the miracles. Now, I think that it's obvious that a lot of these supposed miracles are actually fake, but even if we believe that these miracles are real, that still doesn't mean that God is approving of Benny Hinn or everything that he does. Because remember, Jesus Christ said that false teachers would use signs and wonders to deceive people. Now, another example of false teachers who tried to use numbers or results to justify an event or an action is Mike Todd a couple of years ago whenever they had their Easter service at Transformation Church. And there was a lot of really bad, ungodly things that happened at this supposed church service, such as inappropriate dance routines, doing Beyonce covers in a church. There were people on the stage in immodest, provocative outfits. It was really more of a secular performance than a church service. And yet, whenever he was criticized for what happened, he kept wanting to point people to the hundreds of people who had gotten saved. And as I said before, it's not like I don't care about people getting saved. I want that to happen, but I also care about glorifying God. I also care about faithfully teaching His Word. And whenever people try to use results to justify their actions, they're really implying that people couldn't have gotten saved if they had done things God's way. And often people view this as a supposed contrast where they will see God's way on one side and then what works on the other side. But in reality, God's way does work. You see, simply following the Bible is not such a horrible plan that you have to ignore it to get people saved. Now, a verse that people will often use to try to justify false teachers or false groups like cult groups is Matthew 7.20, and it's where Jesus said, "'Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them.'" Often this is used to justify people, but I think that the people who are trying to use this verse this way are just selectively choosing which fruits to identify them by. For example, whenever you call out Mormons, sometimes people will say that you will know them by their fruits and then point to their kindness or to their charity work as if these are the good fruits that justify whatever they do. But recognize here that false doctrine is also a fruit, and it is a fruit that condemns them. And so, whenever people say that you will know them by their fruits, that's exactly what I agree with. And whenever you have false doctrines and false teachings and bad practices in a church, yeah, by their fruits you will know them, and that is not a good thing for these people. 
And now the last sign of a false teacher that we're going to talk about in this video is that they abuse their authority. And before I really get into this, I do want to make it clear that I believe in pastoral authority. I believe that churches can exercise church discipline, and I think that pastors can and should reprove at times those who err from the Christian faith. I think that pastors have a duty to feed the flock with God's word. And even just in the simple names for a pastor, such as bishop, which means overseer, or pastor, which means shepherd, we see that pastors should have authority. Pastors have real responsibilities here, and I think that this is a biblical doctrine that can't be denied. But I'll also point out here that many pastors will overreach on their authority, and they'll pretend to have a level of authority that isn't rightfully theirs. You see, pastoral authority does not mean that members always have to follow their pastor. It doesn't mean that they have unlimited, unchecked authority. No person has an authority equal to the Bible. And you know, some false teachers will deceive other people to get things like money or fame. But I think that many of them also do it to get power and control. And so I think that it's really important that we follow what 1 Peter chapter 5 says, where it says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. You see, the job of a pastor is to feed the flock. They are to have oversight, not as a lord or as a boss, but as an example. You see, spiritual authority figures shouldn't be control freaks. And I can think of a lot of pastors and leaders who have abused their authority and overreached and pretended to have authority that they shouldn't have had, and sadly, many of their followers fell for it. I think about people like Bill Gothard, Jim Jones, Ted Haggard, David Koresh, Ravi Zacharias, Mark Driscoll, Joseph Smith, Benny Hinn, John Lindell. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on of people who have abused their authority. And some of these men didn't even have authority rightfully in the first place. And I think that it's good for both church members and pastors to recognize that any person's authority is supposed to be checked by the Bible. I mean, we see this in Acts chapter 17 with the church in Berea, where Paul and Silas had gone to preach to them. And it says that after they preached that these, the Bereans, were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. And this is an evidence that any human authority figure has to submit to the Bible, no person has an authority that's equal to the Bible. And so, whenever a person uses their spiritual authority or their platform to contradict the Bible or to preach another gospel, or whenever they try to overreach and overextend on their authority, that's a really bad sign, and it is an evidence of a false teacher. So those are seven of the biggest red flags whenever it comes to identifying a false teacher. And if this video was a help, then give us a like to help promote this content to more people and make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss the next episode. All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.